Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on September 8th here at First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And we are going to read our daily lectionary texts for today and uh, talk about it, pray about it, and see how God might be um, working to transform our lives and hopefully yours as well. So let me open this in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for the many blessings that you provide for us. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to read your word and to uh, and to talk about it. Uh, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be present with us. I know he always is, uh, but help us to be attentive to what the Holy Spirit is saying, that we might be transformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Starting today with Psalm 94. 84. <clears throat> 84. Once again, here we go. At least it's not, what, 2013? <laughs> we are still in right We are still in 2023, <laughs> right? Okay. Psalm 84, right? How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O oh, Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O oh God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. In Psalm 148, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his host. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded, and they were created. He established them for ever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew scripture reading is from 1 Kings chapter 11, starting at verse 26 and going through verse 43. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of Zeredah, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, rebelled against the king. The following was the reason he rebelled against the king. Solomon built the Milo and closed up the gap in the wall of the city of his father David. The man Jeroboam was very able, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. About that time, when Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. Ahijah had clothed himself with a new garment. The two of them were alone in the open country when Ahijah laid hold of the new garment he was wearing and tore it into twelve pieces. He then said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, See, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, and will give you ten tribes. One tribe will remain his for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. This is because he has forsaken me, 
worshipped Astarte, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and has not walked in my ways, doing what is right, not, uh, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my ordinances, as his father David did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom away from him, but will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, and who did keep my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom away from his son and give it to you, that is, the ten tribes. Yet to his son I will give one tribe, so that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. I will take you, and you shall reign over all that your soul desires. You shall be king over Israel. If you will listen to all that I command you, walk in my ways, and do what is right in my sight, by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, I will be with you, and will build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. For this reason, I will punish the descendants of David, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam promptly fled to Egypt, the king Shishak to, of Egypt, and remained in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, all that he did, as well as all that is written, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? The time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was forty years. Solomon slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of his father David, and his son Rehoboam succeeded him. And from James chapter 4, verses 13 through chapter 5, verse 6. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Anyone, then, who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, commits sin. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. Our gospel lesson today comes from Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 22 and going through verse 32. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. And back to our psalm, Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. 
Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They will abide in prosperity, and their children shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all its troubles. And our final psalm today is Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Here I am. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. For evils have encompassed me without number. My iniquities have overtaken me until I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let all those be put to shame and confusion who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who desire my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Um, when I was reading these this morning, I, you know, how can you not make that connection between Psalm 40 and what's going on in Mark 15? Right. Um, psalm 40 it is a psalm of david and david within psalm 40 does reference um, some of his own iniquity some of his own sins um, but most of psalm 40 again is is crying out for deliverance you know, dependence upon god uh, all of the ways that uh, the, the glory of God, David has been revealing that to the people, sharing that with the people, teaching the people, all these kind of things, yet he continues to find himself in these dire circumstances. Right. And here we have in Mark 15 um, a just uh, brief um, 
you know, brief description of the crucifixion of Jesus, and it's not even really a description of it. It's it's describing kind of what other people were doing. I've I've read somewhere, heard somewhere recently that even the gospel writers, the the shame of crucifixion was so great that they they didn't write a lot about it. They just right. simply say he was crucified. And um, I, I think we as you know, Westerners 2,000 years later can't, uh, can't imagine the horror or the shame or what that might entail, but obviously the original readers and, and hearers of, of the Gospels would have understood. And that word shame uh, that is repeated a couple times in Psalm 40. Um, you know, let, let those be put to shame who seek to snatch away my life, but here is Jesus experiencing the shame right. and all of the dishonor that is being put in David's direction, now the dishonor that's being put on Jesus and even the, even the people that are laughing about it. Right. And, and I, and and oh. even the mocking, you know, they're just like, you, you're going to destroy the temple and you're going to rebuild it in three days? Okay, how's that working out for you? Right. And, you know, that's that would have, I mean, I, I can imagine that that was what they thought. And they and they they thought they had won. And, right. and in that, you know, it's, it's almost a joke to them that he would right. say that. And yet they have won. And they have... They're killing him. I mean, they're killing him. And um, he can do all of this, but he can't even save himself. Like, you know, it's... And, and, he, and here's Jesus dying on the cross, and he knows. And instead of putting them in their place, like, you know, humanity, you know, we want people to... If somebody, if somebody says this to me, I'm going to say this back, or I'm going to... And yet... In humility, he doesn't respond to that, right? And so, and how difficult, um, how difficult that would be. Um, how how impossible for us, right? <laughs> right. right, right. And so, and yet, dying even for those who mocked him, right? And I can imagine hoping that there is a transformation and that in three days in that revelation what is their response to that right you know loving them enough to die hoping that there will be a transformation right um and i think yeah again just thinking about how if jesus you know jesus was fully human fully god and fully human and it's one of these things where if Jesus did come down off the cross, if Jesus didn't actually die, then he would not have actually been fully, fully human. human. And so to the, the necessity of the cross as horrible and as shameful, um, you know, terrible. Yeah, and and again, I, I don't think we can even really imagine like you the know the brutality. Right. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, yet Jesus went willingly, and then died willingly, and was subjected to all of the mocking. We've already talked about it, but just isn't it interesting though that Psalm forty and Mark fifteen are are right there, and you know, Mark Mark doesn't describe. Jesus, the, the temptations in the wilderness to the same extent that, say, Matthew does. But even uh, what we see here at the end is kind of an echo of the temptations that uh, were written about in Matthew. You know, Satan's like, hey, just, just throw yourself off the pinnacle and I'll keep you alive. And everyone will go, whoa, that's amazing. And you can have all of this and everybody will worship you. And, and so this time, just come down off the cross. Then we'll believe. Then we right. worship. There's and an easier way. There's an easier way. And, you know, I, I don't doubt if Jesus actually had come down off the cross, people would have been impressed. But right. would that have done what needed to be done? And I think that's just kind of the thing. They, they, These people probably 
would have, again, they would have been impressed with his power, they would have been impressed by his authority, but they still would not have had changed hearts. Right. And then we would still actually even be dead in our own sins. And right. so um, the temptation I think that many of us still face is how do we, uh, how do we walk in the path of Jesus and are patient with the, you know, as David would write about the, the mm-hmm. shame or, you know, the mocking or whatever. Um, how do we continue to walk in the path of Jesus obediently and faithfully and long in the same direction, as Eugene Peterson would say, long obedience in the same direction, um, without, uh, without trying to take matters into our own hands. Right with trusting that he is the one, that Jesus is the one who demonstrated for us the path that we ourselves should follow. Um, and, and so, you know, you jump over to James and, uh, you know, these are tough passages from James. I, you know, I challenge, I challenge any of us to read through James in its entirety and not think, oops, I'm, uh, I'm falling into the trap that the world usually lays for us. And that is, you know, accumulate for yourself, do all these things, uh, uh, but what what is James specifically talking about here is how does even the economic system back in his day operate? Mm-hmm. Well, it operates kind of the same way today. Let's go right. do this, let's make a bunch of money. Yeah, make a plan, got a business plan, five-year plan, right? We got our business plan and we're gonna make a lot of money and and James is like, you don't even know if tomorrow is is available yeah. to you, you know. And and even if you do accumulate a lot of money, what becomes the problem? You know, well, yeah. come on, rich people, weep and wail because you're storing up for yourself uh, uh, that that will that is not everlasting. It's it's not everlasting, and even your own riches will. Um, you know, eat your flesh like fire. And it's like... Pretty brutal. Pretty, pretty <laughs> brutal because it's just um, different than what the world says. Right. And, is it, and, 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 and if we're honest, it's a temptation for all of us. You know, we know that greed and envy and lust are common for all of humanity. And... We think, oh yeah, poor people are just, you know, they're greedy for the wealth of others. But how many rich people do any of us know that are completely satisfied with where they are? Right. Where they always need more, always more. You know the what, if I big, just, the next big. what's the next big thing? And then I'll be satisfied. But it's never enough because it, it consumes it consumes us, the desire for riches. It's not even just an eternal thing, it's a temporal thing. That right. desire consumes us such that we become hollow shells of people if all we are is our money. It's pretty superficial, and that can be so fleeting. Right, right. Um. Mm. Right. So let's go back to the first kings and complain about how other people do it wrong. You know, right? Because <laughs> right. it's striking too close to home. But uh, the first kings passage, if you've been keeping up with the daily lectionary texts, you will see how uh, so much of what's happened with Solomon in terms of him uh, building the temple and uh, asking for wisdom from God and demonstrating great wisdom in, in deciding judgments on earth and all this kind of stuff. And, and you're thinking, yeah, you know, this is great. He's the son of David. He's got this covenant renewed. It's all going to be good. And then there's the chapter that preceded this where, uh, where uh, Solomon is distracted. I don't know, uh, consumed by um, the great wealth that he has. What does he use it for? Well, he, he does build the temple, and that's great. But then he takes a bunch of foreign wives. He, he makes sacrifices on those altars. He worships these abomination idols, uh, you know, devil, devilry gods, you know, ones that require child sacrifice. And, and, and you're like, wait, like Solomon... Like things were so you good. You were doing 
Right. And the promises were there. You you had it. You, you had it. Yep. You had it. And then it just goes the other way. Right. And and what's fascinating to me is again, God speaks through another prophet and talks to this guy, Jeroboam. And and you know, the whole imagery of tearing up the new garment, you know, and in a way it kind of was. It was the new garment, you know, David and then Solomon. It's like, yes, it was 40 years with David and now 40 years with Solomon, but it's still this new thing, like a, a combined, peaceful, faithful kingdom. Oh no, it's all shredded up, torn ripped up, apart. ripped apart. Hmm. And and what I'm, I'm always intrigued by, again, God offers Jeroboam the same opportunity. Right. Follow me faithfully and I will make you and your descendants the, the kingdom. You know, I right. will give, you know, and all that stuff. And we'll find out if you keep reading that Jeroboam messes it up too. Right. Like everybody. But I find it interesting as as we're reading through the, the text for today, um, you know, the it's ripped apart. I'm going to give you these ten, but I'm going to maintain mm-hmm. Solomon's rule over, um, you know, the one tribe because of the promises that I made for David, right. and he was good, and he followed God, and he did all of these things. But when we look at David, David screwed a lot of stuff up as well. Mm-hmm. But then there was repentance, and there right. was recognition, and right. so I think sometimes as we read through this, and it's easy to get well it's impossible we can't do it right it is impossible we can't do it but but the heart and when we maintain that humility that we read about it in the psalms as well but when we maintain that humility david screwed a lot of things up but god is still honoring those promises and those covenants he made with right. david because there was repentance and there was recognition of wrongdoing there right. and i think that's um that's so important because that reveals the nature and the character of God. Right. That He is faithful. He is just. Right. He is truthful to what He um, says He will do. And so He's still honoring David, even mm-hmm. though David messed up. Solomon messed up, but there has to be that repentance. Has to be that repentance. And and again, uh, I know we've talked about it before that the the problem was not a king. The problem was the people of Israel didn't honor their true king. They right. didn't recognize that that God is king, that he is sovereign, that he rules and reigns over all things, but his commandments are just, his commandments are merciful, his commandments are full of grace, his commandments are all about restoration and mm-hmm. reconciliation and even just rest in him. So the problem is not a king per se, the problem is every human king that came had these flaws but they were all pointing towards the true king who was to come jesus and again jesus is from the line of david jesus is from even solomon and and god maintains his covenant promises despite our failures Mm -hmm. um god establishes his promises and then fulfills them and so we see um, you know, if uh, King Jesus rules and reigns even while on the cross, and just that uh, the, the the suffering servant king, um, totally different than what right. the world would say. Back to James, totally different than what mm-hmm. the world says. And so, if we are feeling convicted, if we're feeling conflicted. Um, well, yeah, because we live in the world and we do worldly things. And Jesus is like, nope, there are heavenly things that are different. There are eternal better, and better eternal. things. Right, right. Well, and that's even when in the Old Testament, when they asked for a king, well, everybody else has a king. Right. It was for worldly reasons. Mm-hmm. It was so we can be like everyone else. Right. But we are called specifically to not be like everybody else, um, right. because we are to look beyond to right. to greater and better and bigger and eternal things right. um, that don't look like the ways of the world and the kingdoms of the world. Right. So, just to kind of I don't know wrap that up. 
just how in the world do we live in the world but not worldly, if that makes sense. I know I've got a lot of worlds in there, but um, <laughs> okay, I understand. how in the world do we do that? How right? do we live in the world but not be of the world, right? Yeah, um, yeah you got an answer for that? Well, uh, <laughs> sure, right? You know, uh, um, I, I think that it definitely is that is that is the temptation because we live in a world that is right here in front of us and we interact with people that play by the rules of the world. And so how do you step outside of that but yet still maintain relationships with people that are playing by a different set of standards? I mean, it's a different set of rules and expectations. Right. Right. I think that is, that's the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. I think that that is the constant temptation that we have right. and um, that I think we have to keep that in check mm. constantly I don't think that I think that's a daily yeah right I know that's not an answer well, that's just right <laughs> compounding the just problem Thank, thanks Natalie yeah, compounding the just, problem it's right. just harder and harder the and more we think you're about looking, it you've got an answer well I, and, and I think you know we are and I think that's where in the Psalms we find recognition of that tension. Yes. Um, and, you know, even the, uh, like the Psalms of David again is here are the external problems that are facing me. Here mm -hmm. are the internal problems that are facing me. But how do we glorify God in all of that? And I think that's probably, that's probably where the answer lies as we, as we wrestle with the reality of the Psalms and the uh, the tension and the conflict that exists within. You know, we're praising God, but we're sometimes feeling separated from God. You know, right. we're we're feeling tormented, but sometimes we're feeling joyful, and sometimes we 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 rail against the wickedness of other people, and then there are times that we have to wail against the the wickedness in our own heart, and uh, and so you know, when in doubt. You know, read read the Psalms, but read them consistently. And and if one of them is standing out to you on a particular day, uh, great. And if another one, not so much, it's okay. You right. know, be, because we go through living life in that tension um, of living in the world, but not living a worldly life. Right. Uh, being a follower of Jesus, but still having sin that that holds us back from. Right true obedience um, yeah and just trust that the true king does rule and reign and the true king is good and loving and kind and compassionate and gentle and merciful and desires a relationship with us with you um, and, and turn your life over to him on a daily basis well and you had it open as Psalm 25 and that's that verse 1 in the first part of 2 um, to you O Lord I lift up my soul O my God in you I trust that is all we can do offer our souls our whole being is offered up to God to lead and guide and direct all in trust right and so mm -hmm. yeah it's not it's, easy, though. It's not easy. It's not easy. Well, all right. Well, you want to close this up? I'd be happy to. Great. Gracious Lord, thank you for your words to us today. Um, thank you for loving us. Thank you for offering us hope and redemption. Um, just be with us in those moments when we do cry out and that we do wail and that we, we do know that, that we can't do it perfectly and we do live in a broken world that is so easy to fall into the temptations and I just pray that we turn our hearts to you and that we do look to you and trust and that that we can we can repent that we can come back to you in those times that that we do fall or that we stumble and uh, knowing that you are a good and gracious God and that you are true and your love is steadfast and eternal and I just pray that you open our hearts and our eyes that we may look beyond what is right in front of us and that we do look with hope to the eternal promises that you offer to us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, thanks for joining us today. We look forward to the next time we head together. Take care. Bye-bye.